Hello and welcome to this introduction to hydrographic surveying. My name is William Kelly. I'm a lecturer in geospatial science and I'm the program convener for the Land and Hydrographic Surveying MSc program. So in this introductory lecture of hydrographic surveying, we're going to take a very top level overview of the discipline. Hydrographic surveying is the discipline of collecting and mapping the world's oceans and seas, as well as inland rivers and waterways. Hydrographic survey is incredibly important for safety of navigation, but also in the support of all sorts of economic and environmental activities. So why is hydrographic surveying so important? Well, fundamentally, safety of navigation at sea for commercial and non-commercial vessels and water users is extremely important. Increasingly, we are seeing larger and larger ships and tankers transporting all sorts of goods across the world, and we have to ensure that they can operate safely. Hydrographic survey is also extremely important in the monitoring and attainment of the UN's sustainable development goals, because several of these goals directly relate to the world's oceans, the natural habitats, the flora and fauna, as well as developing sustainable infrastructure networks, for example, the transport of goods, as well as establishing alternate and sustainable energy sources. There are all sorts of other applications of hydrographic surveying, from monitoring the effects of climate change, so monitoring sea level rises, coastal erosion, as well as for recreational use of waterways, particularly inland waters and lakes and locks. So how do we actually perform hydrographic surveys? Well, of course, we need to have some kind of suitable vehicle to operate from, often the water surface. These can range from fairly small vessels, perhaps of 10 meters in length, capable and suitable of surveying uh, near the coast in shallow water, or inland, including rivers and estuaries. For performing hydrographic surveys further out at sea and in the deep ocean, much larger, more stable vessels are required. Of course, not all hydrographic surveys are actually performed from the sea surface. Many hydrographic surveys are actually performed subsea by various robots or other technologies. Remotely operated vehicles are essentially robots that can be deployed from a vessel and operate subsea via remote control, along with a payload of suitable sensors to perform mapping tasks. And this is extremely useful if we want to, to get a lot of detail of what is actually on the seabed or for performing uh, support work for energy infrastructure projects. However, we also have autonomous underwater vehicles which can be deployed into the ocean with the mapping task plan and the autonomous vehicle can then position itself and dive to the required water depths and start performing hydrographic surveys. So in hydrographic survey, our main aim is often to map the seabed floor or some kind of natural or built feature on the seabed. So how do we achieve that? Well, the first step is to position our survey vehicle in the real world. And most commonly, the primary method of establishing a real world 3D position of a survey vehicle, such as a, a surveying vessel, is to use GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. This is where we have antennae installed on the survey vehicle that receive continuous coded information from orbiting positional satellites. In the very simple level, this works similar to GNSS or GPS that you may be familiar with in your phone or your smartwatch or in navigation tools in your car. However, for hydrographic surveying applications, we are often trying to achieve a higher level of accuracy. So it is often the case that we are using multiple antennas as well as receiving not just signals from the orbiting satellites, but also some kind of positional correction uh, from a base station to improve the system's accuracy. For many hydrographic survey applications, we are looking to achieve a positional quality of 
a sub one meter. So we have the vessel's position obtained by GNSS, but how do we model and control the vessel with respect to its direction, i.e. how do we know where to drive the vessel and where to perform the survey, and which way is the vessel pointing? That's achieved by the use of a gyro compass, and this is a device that is capable of reporting the vessel's heading with respect to true north. Of course, a vessel sailing at sea and performing hydrographic surveys doesn't just sit perfectly stable on the water surface. It's moving dynamically. So we have to model this in real time by using something called a motion sensor. And within a motion sensor, there are series of individual little sensors that measure displacements and rotations in certain directions. So we're able to measure if the vessel is actually pitching up and down or if it's rolling from side to side in real time. These sensors are important because they help provide real-time corrections for the mapping systems that we use. To map the seabed, we're going to have to use a whole host of other sensors and also energy waves. The energy waves that we use for positioning, such as from satellites, do not propagate well through water. However, sound waves do. In hydrographic survey, ultimately what we are wanting to do is to measure the seabed, and that involves fundamentally measuring some kind of distance. And of course, to measure some kind of distance from the vessel to the seabed floor, we're going to have to have a good idea of the speed of the energy that travels through the water column. So we need to understand and model the speed of sound. This is very important in order to be able to obtain an accurate depth measurement for the hydrographic survey map. Unfortunately, the speed of sound does not travel through the water column at a constant speed. It can vary significantly with the environmental status of the water column. And so when we are performing hydrographic surveys, it is important that we take several environmental readings to calculate a speed of sound value. Now, the speed of sound depends on conductivity, temperature, and pressure. Temperature generally has a very significant impact in the first part of the water column. And as we move to deeper water, for example, past several hundred meters, pressure becomes the dominant factor. It's not just the fact that the speed of sound changes as it travels through the water column, it's also that its path refracts. So we have to be able to measure this and model it for various hydrographic survey systems. For example, if we were positioning a subsea robot using acoustics. A sound velocity profiler is a sensor deployed from a survey vehicle through the water column to the seabed and it continually takes various measurements such as temperature and pressure. There are some sensors that are able to calculate sound velocity uh, directly by taking very short measurement between a, a small baseline at the bottom of a sensor, but often we are collecting what is called CTD data in order to be able to calculate from some kind of model a speed of sound value. So that speed of sound value is then used by the surveyor in order to calculate an accurate distance measurement from the sensor on the survey vehicle to the seabed. So we know we have to use sound to map the seabed. There are various ways that we can use sound waves. These are often grouped and termed as echo sounders. And these are sensors that can generate sound waves that propagate through the water column and wait for the return in order for a distance to be calculated. A very common method of mapping the seabed is the use of a multi-beam sensor. A multi-beam sensor is able to generate perhaps hundreds of individual beams of sound and propagates through the water column in a fan shape below the survey vehicle. And this means that you're able to build up a very dense picture of what the seabed looks like. Coupled with the fact that the vessel is driving in a predetermined survey line or survey direction, this enables us to build up a continuous profile of the seabed. In the first instance, the multi-beam survey captures an initial swath directly underneath the vessel. Now, when the vessel is moving 
and logging survey data in a particular direction, those individual swaths accumulate and eventually build a complete 3D picture of the seabed. Hydrographic survey is actually very exciting because often you are performing a survey of an area that you can't physically see and perhaps no one else has seen it either. So you are potentially mapping areas that have never been seen before. Uh, and uh, there are pro there is a project now to map the world's oceans and seas, primarily because we know so little about the sea about the seabed. Uh, it is estimated that we have high quality seabed data and mapping information for just over 20% of the, the world's oceans. So there is a lot of seabed out there that we have no idea what it looks like or what's there. So multi-beam sensors are extremely useful. However, they do require expert calibration and very careful usage to achieve optimum results. And on the Land and Hydrographic Surveying course, you will learn about the calibrations and the, the processing required to perform these surveys to a high degree of quality. So multi-beam surveys can be used for a variety of applications. They can, of course, be used simply to measure depth, to, to create a 2D or a chart or a, a 3D model. Uh, but beyond that, they are used for all sorts of monitoring and engineering tasks, such as surveys to perform structural integrity of sea defenses. They're also used in subsea archaeology and conservation to monitor the condition of subsea wrecks. They can also be used to find lost objects such as shopping trolleys and cars. So we are taking measurements from a survey vehicle, often using sound to map the seabed. It is the surveyor's job to ensure that data is of appropriate quality. But there are also various other tasks that must be performed as well. We are taking observations, of course, not from a fixed platform, but a dynamic and changing water level. And so hydrographic surveying is also concerned with the measurement and monitoring of tides. Tides, of course, are the relative periodic rise and fall of water. This is important to the surveyor because as we make a measurement at one point in time, it may not directly relate to the water level at another. So we have to be able to make corrections for this tide and we also have to be able to relate our observations to some kind of common datum. So what causes tides? These are primarily astronomical forces between celestial bodies, i.e. the sun and the moon, as well as physical conditions on Earth. Why should we care about tides? Well, fundamentally, in hydrographic survey, we are concerned with vessel safety and having changing or unexpected water levels can be dangerous. But the depth measurements that we use are, are also the basis of further calculations, models, volumes that we compute. And, and so we want to be able to uh, have a consistent measurement point. So the primary astronomical forces that create tides are, of course, the gravitational pull from the moon and from the sun. Whilst the sun is much larger than the moon, it is, of course, much, much further away. Given the proximity of the moon, it means that it has a much greater impact on our tides. And gravita gravitational pull from a celestial body will cause a rush of water to move across the surface of the Earth towards that source of gravity. These create tidal bulges on the side of Earth that are closest to the Moon. But on the opposite side of Earth, we have the Earth's inertia that is overcoming the gravitational force from the Moon, and it creates a similar tidal bulge on the other side of the Earth. So these tidal bulges create our high tides, and as water rushes away from one location to another to create a high tide, then the other locations are experiencing low tides. So if we have to correct our depth measurements to account for, for tides, then we have to be able to consult a tidal model to determine the correction that is required to reduce our depths to a particular chart datum. Tides change periodically, of course. In some locations, you may have two high tides a day and two low tides, but in other locations, the tidal pattern may be quite different. 
It's important, therefore, for a hydrographic surveyor to study charts and predictions carefully so that the hydrographic survey can be planned appropriately and safely. These tidal charts also provide the values or corrections that we can use to adjust our observations. The tidal correction value can range from tens of centimetres to several metres. So therefore, in order to provide a consistent and accurate map product, then these corrections have to be considered. So we have collected our hydrographic survey measurements and data. We then move into the important phase of data processing and quality control and assurance. All of the sensors that we use in hydrographic surveying have varying capabilities and various quoted accuracies and performance constraints. Therefore, when we are data processing, it is important that we check quite carefully the raw data that we have collected to ensure that it is operating within specification. This includes all raw data from the vessel, GNSS data, gyro data, motion sensor data, and acoustic data, for example, from multi-beam echo centers. All of the raw data should be inspected with poor data, if possible, corrected or removed. In extreme cases, we may also have to perform some parts of the survey again. Given the importance of the data that we collect, it's for this reason that we often have multiple sensors running concurrently in the case of poor performance or one sensor failing. So we have collected multi-beam echo sender data. These are acoustic returns from the seafloor. Now it's quite normal and expe expected to receive noise or poor returns from these systems. It is not the case that we can accept and use every measurement that we take. So the data processing phase has an important stage where we are cleaning noisy or poor acoustic returns that we have observed from perhaps marine life that exists in the water column. We receive acoustic returns from all sorts of sources and they are not necessarily relevant or of interest for the hydrographic survey. It is therefore important that these data are removed and cleaned before the final map and model product is produced. So often the final product that we are creating is a hydrographic chart. This is a two-dimensional map product which displays the seabed topography as well as any natural or built features. For example, if we were performing a survey of a pipeline or a shipwreck. Of course, a two-dimensional chart is very useful for navigation and various other tasks, but increasingly a common hydrographic survey output is a digital terrain model. And this is a continuous three-dimensional surface that has been created from data collected from a sensor such as a multi-beam echo sender. These are incredibly useful, not just for visualization purposes, but also for inspection and monitoring applications such as plate tectonics, but also quayside walls, maritime sea or coastal defences, and engineering structure integrity such as pipelines. Thank you for watching this very high level introduction to hydrographic surveying. I hope you found it of interest. If you have any questions, then please feel free to get in touch. Thank you.